I have no intention of running from a fight. I have no intention of fleeing to El Salvador. I would rather stick around and fight things out. Okay, Elizabeth, you can talk all, you can spread all the flood you want, but you're literally just strengthening it. Pushing Bitcoin developers and operators, and I'm sure there's plenty of Bitcoin miners that have been spooked in the last couple of years and have gone offshore. That's bad for America, but it's good for Bitcoin. Like you can't stop the money going to good ideas and, and good projects, and then you're incentivizing those good projects getting access to really cheap and available power. 99% of the global population is not on board yet. The boat is still empty. There's a lot of room to grow. Hi, Mike. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Robin. Thanks for, uh, I appreciate you inviting me on to, to talk. I had an opportunity to um, check out your page a little bit. I saw that you've had some pretty great guests on. You've had a friend of mine, Lisa, on on your podcast, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah. Then... Uh, I was listening to a little bit of the Peter Dunlap. You've had some, you've had some pretty solid, uh, pretty solid guests on recently. So, like, I'm looking forward to seeing what kind of questions and conversations we can, we can spark up here. Yeah, it's 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 fascinating. I was coming into the podcast scene and I was like really stressed out, like who will come on my podcast in December? And actually, it kind of a pretty open and generous. They're like, you, you reach out to them, say like, hey. You gotta be on my podcast. I have a new podcast. Nobody's listening to it, but please be a guest of mine. <laughs> and they yeah. actually come on, and uh, this thing is growing uh, rapidly. I come close to the four thousand subscribers on YouTube, and even also on the podcast platforms. Um, like slowly, slowly growing, but yeah. But anyways, uh, the actual topic Bitcoin today. Um, uh, I, and I try to always start with like big questions and trying to get out like what's what's your take on Bitcoin. And okay. for you is like the question today is like, what is for you personally the most exciting part of, of Bitcoin? Like, what are you most excited about Bitcoin? Okay. Um, I, dude, I love this question because there's, as you know, and as a lot of your uh, viewers will know, there's, when it comes to Bitcoin itself, the asset or the network, there's so many facets of it that make it valuable to multiple different um populations and multiple different regions and multiple different sectors uh that you everybody's going to have like their own kind of answer and my answer i think is a little bit different from almost a large portion of other individuals that are like big personalities or just as outwardly spoken as myself um what i'm most excited about when it comes to like the whole bitcoin conversation is that and this is this is also going to be similar to like what I kind of talked about with digital wildcatters is that like the money stuff is awesome. Like, don't get me wrong. Like the investment thesis for Bitcoin is awesome. Um, the protections of savings is awesome. But I think that probably the the what's going to impact people even greater than like just like the savings aspect is going to be the relationship that Bitcoin mining has with energy generation in the energy sector the reason for that is that when you when you look at how everything is priced in today's world everything is downstream from the cost of production and, and like the cost of generating and distributing power right and bitcoin mining was the first thing to really purely and neutrally incentivize just broad spectrum energy generation and our energy accumulation and power generation. Right. So like the, and what I'm getting at is that, so like, I, I'm, I want to invite, I want to invite you and the, and your listeners to kind of consider when we're looking at something like a, like a power grid, right? Like with all the power lines and the, the distribution, um, like the distribution systems, like the transformers and the uh, substations and the, natural gas plants, nuclear plants, hydro plants, like the, the, the entire, the whole shebang, right? Um, when it comes to expanding that ecosystem, you have to, we have to look at it in the sense of, so like we have cities and countries that are growing at a relatively, like you can tie, like when you're looking at a city or a country, you can kind of relatively accurately project or forecast how quickly it's going to be expanding. Right. Like it's a pretty smooth, like kind of like it's got some hills and everything, but it's a pretty smooth line up and to the right. Um, 
unfortunately, expanding infrastructure doesn't seem to kind of follow that same line. Like you can't really afford to. Like you're gonna, it's gonna be more of a step function, right? Like you're gonna expand power and generation up to a point. You're gonna keep it flat for a while. It's gonna be a step function. Then you're gonna expand it up, and then it's gonna go up like that. So like you got like when you, if you're looking at it on a chart, you got the step function with the um with the kind of like average line curve of of growth and expansion kind of like touching the the peaks or the the bottoms of the steps right like the little like line like that um when it comes when you incorporate bitcoin mining into the conversation you have now brought in a relationship of where the demand for power is now perpetual it's 24 7 365 it doesn't fluctuate or it doesn't have to fluctuate like normal power demand on an infrastructure grid is. Um, and in doing so, you can, effect- you can effectively expand power distribution and power generation infrastructure way beyond what the immediate demands of, of the entire like society or local community is currently. And so, and in doing so, because you're providing a, an economic relationship to where these power producers and power generators, power distributors are capable of continuously making money still because they're earning Bitcoin from their efforts, um, you can effectively bring the cost of power down aggressively because they're not just solely relying on the amount of power that you or I are paying to the utility company. And... Now that's all theoretical, right? Like I'm not, I'm not a class, I'm not a like a civil engineer. I'm not. Um, I didn't go to college for engineering or physics. I went to college for exercise science. So, but like the, I think that I'm, like there just isn't. It's not getting enough attention, in my opinion. It's not getting enough um, appreciation for what Bitcoin mining does to the relationship of society in general, because like. When when we're talking when we're talking about disrupting that kind of relationship in a very positive way for the average individual, you're bringing the cost of energy down, right? Which isn't just like paying for all the lights and the Wi-Fi and the routers and stuff doesn't just become cheaper. You start looking at the cost for um, companies and goods to be produced can start to come down, right? Because like the when the relationship first starts, like, don't get me wrong, but the corporations and the big companies that are currently like, they'll be able to take advantage of things like almost immediately. Their margins will probably will be able to go up quickly, but it's going to allow for new ideas to be cheaply made and then distributed quickly. Like that's where things get really interesting. Then you couple that with the relationship of, of Bitcoin and like how it's, um, you can't stop it. You can't stop the, the commerce that's being done on Bitcoin you get this really interesting ecosystem where like you can't stop the money going to good ideas and and good projects. And then you're incentivizing those good projects, getting access to really cheap and available power. Like that's a future that I'm excited for. And then on top of that, uh, the money aspects comes in where uh, when everybody holds uh, every company and every individual uh, holds their money in Bitcoin, then they also get like uh, more purchasing power over time. Yep. There's like an, an additional kind of, I mean, it was a little bit in there already. I feel like this is like an underrated discussion anyways in, in, in Bitcoin, because when you have Bitcoin, all the costs are coming down eventually. The electricity part is like extremely fascinating for me and also really hard for me to wrap the head around. I also had the discussion with your friend, Lisa, uh, about yeah. that, uh, she has a big claim like uh, monetizing every molecule, which is fascinating to see that companies are paying actually money to get away with, <laughs> with energy, excess energy that they have. They can actually just make money out of that when they turn on the Bitcoin miners, but they don't do it because of uh, reasons, um, which is uh, fascinating for me that uh, they're not doing that. Mm-hmm. And uh, this energy uh, topic is not too much talked about. I feel like that could be an, a massive yeah. uh, adoption wave uh, coming. Do you also see it like as, as Lisa that uh, this energy uh, debate could be like the next wave of massive adoption when a lot of new energy producers actually come in and see all of the sudden this Bitcoin play with the energy part and then maybe also discover the monetary part and ev- maybe also do go like a micro strategy route where they're putting on the balance sheet and, and uh, stuff like that. 
Oh, dude, without a doubt. Like the, I, I, the conversations that I've had offline or privately, there are serious discussions being had within the U S department of energy. Um, I know of a project that is going to be coming online or that is like is in the planning stage now for a new nuclear reactor that is going to be immediately serviced or supported by Bitcoin mining um, as part of like as part of like the core aspect of the project. Um, there's um, serious stuff going on with like the the wind and solar discussion. Um, I get like and like ignore the tribalistic stuff between like the the green energy and the, like the fossil fuel stuff or like hydrocarbons was more accurately put. Um, because in, in my opinion, like the, the best thing for humanity is just like, we're generating power in whatever way we can as, as constantly as we can. And as, um, as potent as we can just to get like the flow of electrons out there, drive the cost of power down. Right. Um, and just like having diverse sources like that between nuclear oil, or you don't really use oil for power, but nuclear, natural gas, um, we could have heating oil. I guess you could put that in there. Wind, solar, hydro. Um, all of these things are going to be good ideas. Like not like they all have their, their place in the ecosystem because they're just going to diversify between all the different forms. Like they're going to ebb and flow and everything. And that's awesome. But I, yeah, like to your, like to your point you made, like a lot of these companies, like they don't want to touch the whole Bitcoin or Bitcoin mining topic just because, you know, reasons as you put it, like it's, it's largely just kind of like, um, it's almost like a taboo topic. Right. Like, and the Elizabeth Warrens of the world have done a pretty a relatively good job of just kind of like seeding the fear of the whole conversation by the, the average um, citizen, um, kind of like the whole reefer madness did with like the whole marijuana topic. Um, but like, we're getting to the point of where like the, like just the consistent conversations like we're having now, of like just based in logic and rationale and fact and truth is like it's like you you can't beat those kinds of conversations um because anything else outside of that is reliant upon lies and on, like on our side is is time right because like if your argument is based solely off lies you your time is against you because then the more people that find out the truth the more people that think things through logically the more that like that that power system arose that, that's being supported by lies um, and I, there are, I've had, I've had plenty of other conversations as far as like the Bitcoin mining and energy topic that, um, people don't really fully grasp because they can't see, like, it's not out in public. Like, um, for example, with the simply Bitcoin guys, um, last year around June or July, when the whole like BlackRock stuff started like coming out, BlackRock started like talking more positively about Bitcoin. I have, I still hold the theory that I think that BlackRock largely got orange pilled because of the oil and gas industry, because of my experiences with, um, when I was working for great American mining and helping out, out the field out there with like deployments and re like, and just like putting in new ASICs and everything. The, the big oil guys out there in North Dakota in the back end basin, like they were all dabbling with Bitcoin mining. And that was two years ago now. And they had been doing it since 2017. Like it's all out there. It's just it's just private. Like they're they're keeping hush hush about it for good reason because um, one of the things that I talked about with Great American Mining and with the the relationship with oil and gas and Bitcoin mining is that when we're talking about um, pumping oil out of the ground or you could say releasing oil out of the ground, you're going to get a lot of natural gas along with it. It's just part of the natural. It's just part of the the, the relationship when oil is there. There's off oftentimes more often than not there's going to be associated natural gas and that relationship can produce pressure right and you utilize that pressure to get the oil up out and now a lot of these companies whether it's bp or chevron or shell or um conical phillips or uh any of these other like big 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 wave oil producers or any of the guys that are out in the Middle East with the United Arab Emirates, um, if you're going to get something like natural gas, you 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 want to make an economic use of it, right? Um, oftentimes that, and with natural gas, that means piping it in gas form, or and you set it off to the market or like a, a harbor to to be transported wherever, 
or you, you liquefy it, which requires significant amount of work in order to freeze it. And then you put it in a massively pressurized container and then you ship it that way to wherever it's, it's going to be ma- like making the market. Right. Um, both of those options are extremely expensive because every couple of hundred miles, if you're going to, if you're going to pipe out the gas, you have to have a uh, pressure station, which is going to repressurize the system to keep the gas flowing. Um, that's all of that's obviously expensive. So like if the, if either of those two options are not deemed economical by these, um, producers, then the other options are to vent it or to flare it, right? And venting it is just letting it off into the atmosphere. And that's where it gets a lot of the, um, environmentalists kind of up in a hubbub, which, you know, I, I'm not saying that they're wrong for it, but just throwing this stuff up in the air is generally probably not a great idea. Um, or there's flaring it, which can consume, uh, a good amount of the gas of the the noxious fumes like the methanes and stuff that everybody is so concerned about but that you have district they have disruption by weather right because if the wind is blowing at a particular rate it's going to affect how much of that flame actually consumes that gas um so this is where bitcoin mining fit into that relationship is instead of sending it out through a pipe or liquefying it or venting it out or flaring it you run it through after it's been filtered, you run it through a natural uh, uh, generator that consumes that natural gas, turns it into electricity, and then you use that electricity to produce Bitcoin mining or produce Bitcoin, right, through Bitcoin mining. And the interesting thing that we saw with Great American Mining was that when we were bringing on Bitcoin miners onto these oil and gas operations, by consuming this natural gas and consuming it at a consistent rate and like monitoring things and making sure we were keeping a good like 95, 99% uptime, um, we were effectively allowing those oil and gas operations to pump more oil while also less in, like impacting the environment in a negative way less, right? That's nothing but wins. That's wins across the board. Like everybody wants more oil. Everybody wants less like methane getting up in the atmosphere. Everybody wants more Bitcoin, right? Like there's no, there's no losing there. Um, so things like that are happening in the U S right now. Um, they're also happening in the middle East and North Africa really aggressively. Um, we've seen the things with Bitcoin mining and hydro with, I believe it was Bhutan, right? Like they have, I think like a, like a billion dollar operation or something like that going on. Um, We have like the hydroelectric that's going on with like Greg Foss is involved in Canada. Um, I believe there's maybe another one in the Northwest of the United States. Um, Then we have the nuclear stuff that's being tested with CleanSpark um, and TerraWolf. Or is it TerraWolf? It was either TerraWolf or Standard Power. It might've been, it might've been uh, one or two or the both. I can't, I I, I can't keep track anymore. But the thing, the, the point is after this long kind of like rant or diatribe is that the relationship with Bitcoin mining and the the entire broader energy sector is very bullish. It's being had in a number of different rooms um, in various serious manners. And just nobody, nobody like the general public just doesn't know. It's just, it's not in front of cameras. Um, it's not being touched on by Elizabeth Warren because she doesn't care. She's ignorant and she like, she doesn't know what she doesn't know. Um, but yeah, I'm, I am extremely bullish on what Bitcoin mining and the energy relationship is going to be doing to society over the next couple of decades. Do, do you feel that, uh, Bitcoin mining becomes too much of a specialized, uh, operation? I mean, we saw that, uh, that it does not matter that much because in 2017 with the block size was also like, I feel, I feel like over 90% of the miners were on the different side. Uh, actually, the, then, then we the current the current Bitcoin that we have, so miners are not that much in control of the network that uh, that most think. Uh, but Bitcoin miner mining has become a quite specialized operation. Like the, the facilities are getting bigger and and, and 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 really good. And if you really want to have a mining facility, you basically have to like uh, have some some order to get cheap electricity. Um, there are a lot of interesting applications where you just like put some solar roofs on your ha- on your house. Might as well just also put a miner there. If you sometimes have too much energy, storing it is sometimes inefficient. Uh, maybe storing in the Bitcoin miners and using the financial energy is is, is a better way 
they are like mining heaters, small heaters where you can get the electricity and like do like as a household applications. Um, do do you see like an, an future where like every household has like Bitcoin miners kind of in, integrated, or is it like an an specialized operations where like facilities have it, or or are you in fear also that it's too much a specialized operations and operated only by big big players? Um, that's a good question. I think that the big players right now they're in a, they're in a race against time. Um, because the way that I see like the whole Bitcoin mining industry, so part of my background is I spent in my youth, I played a lot of video games, right? And, um, I want, I want, uh, you and your, your audience to kind of consider what, what has happened in the video game space between specifically consoles and PC, right? Because PC was the dominant one for a very long time in the last 10 years or so we've been watching as consoles have been catching up right because like the uh the whole technology between like gpu cpu like that whole relationship the advancements have allowed for um the competition to start like spreading out and being more distributed rather than a peak right for like very specific players to dominate i see the same thing happening right now in bitcoin mining um the more different groups that get exposed to ASICs, um, like especially with how Michael Saylor recently talked about that as being better for processing than GPUs or CPUs and like in, in very specific formats. Um, we're going to start seeing that innovation leading to a dissemination or democratization of the whole Bitcoin mining sector. We're going to, we're going to get to the point. So like the, the big, big industrial level operations are going to dominate for a while. Um, they're going to find their use cases as far as like the marathons and the riots where they're effectively, they're mining Bitcoin on the grid, but they're, they're operating as kind of uh power distributors, right? So when like the, like down in ERCOT, when the grid is on, is experiencing high demand, they can wheel back their demand so that the grid can disseminate that power elsewhere. Right. Um, I think that we're going to get to a point where the average home or larger homes um, will be capable of having maybe maybe comparable is not the right word, but having hash rate at home to the point of where it's not it's not worse than partaking in the in the like the Powerball or the lottery to try and like win some of the um, the Bitcoin subsidy from each block, and that will that will help distribute things. Um, I also think that we're going to be, I think that what's also happening with Bitcoin mining and that whole relationship, like you're talking about with like the specialization and everything, I think that a lot of people are also witnessing and finding use cases for other forms of technology, right? As far as like utilizing, um, the power distribution relationship and, uh, incentivizing individuals to be able to, um, redirect their power consumption for other means right um i think that uh there's a lot going on specifically like specifically with the the home solar panel example that you brought up i think that um because like when the solar panel stuff first started people were realizing it's like oh if i have a big enough roof and i have enough panels i can literally make money off of it by selling it back to the grid some municipalities caught on to that and they didn't like it, right? Like they're like, no, 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 no. Like we, we do that. You don't do that. You, you, there, none of that is going to be happening. I think that that's going to incentivize. We're probably going to be seeing states. Um, if we haven't already, I, I, I don't have enough time to actually, I don't have enough bandwidth to like keep up on all this stuff. But if we haven't yet, we're going to start seeing states and countries and provinces start to take that into their own hands. Like, Hey, if you move here, we don't care what you're doing. If you have if you have solar panels or power generation on your property and you produce more than what you need, you can absolutely sell it to the grid. Like that kind of relationship will absolutely be happening. And then that's gonna incentivize like the redistribution of people, right? Like the emigration and immigration conversation. Um, that will help further strengthen the decentralization of Bitcoin mining. Because, like, the other aspect of, like, your question with specialization is also the centralization question, right? Um, 
I don't know if you had any intentions of talking about Elizabeth Warren, but I, I'm, I, I kind of want to touch on it. I think that Elizabeth Warren is honestly one of the best champions for Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining, and she has no idea why. Um, I think that the recent kind of like fears stoked around Bitcoin mining and trying to ban it with all the stuff that's going on, with all the nonsense going on, including what's happening with like the Samurai team um, and pushing Bitcoin uh, developers and operators. And I'm sure there's plenty of Bitcoin miners that have been spooked in the last couple of years that have gone offshore. Um, that's bad for America, but it's good for Bitcoin, right? In the sense of like, okay, Elizabeth, you can you can talk all, you can spread all the FUD you want, but you're literally just strengthening it. Like, you 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 clearly have no inkling or understanding of how this operates. Like like Bitcoin Bitcoin mining and Bitcoin the asset or like the the um, Bitcoins themselves they're already centrally located in the U.S. Spread it out more by all means. Be my guest. Like I don't think any of us have been playing about that. I, I mean the same thing happened 2021 with China where like before 2021 a lot of mining power a lot of hash rate was actually in China. What was the thing like? 69 70 like it was a really high up at least 55 percent yeah it was a really high up uh, and then they cracked down on it and the only thing that happened is was like a, a short spike down and after like three weeks or something like that the mining hash rate was back up again uh, at the same rate but it was more distributed and now in in china what is there like 10 percent maybe they still didn't <laughs> get rid of it because yep. Bitcoin mining is just, uh, you cannot get rid of it. Like it, it, there will be Bitcoin miners in your country yep. uh, if you want or not. Uh, but you can actually contribute to the decentralization of the Bitcoin network. Uh, so thank you, China. And uh, <laughs> thank you, Elizabeth, <laughs> for that. <laughs> exactly. Uh, talk, talking about centralization, um, a lot of bar, a lot of talks uh, were also around uh, the Bitcoin ETFs and BlackRock's involvement. I mean, obviously, uh, everybody's free to buy Bitcoin, also BlackRock. Uh, so, like, there's there's no no fear in in that mind for me. Uh, but there are a lot of fears around, like, more and more people are custodying their Bitcoin with BlackRock, more and more people with, <laughs> with Coinbase. They have a huge number of of users now because of uh, the ETFs. Also, um, first of all, like. How did you saw the the Bitcoin ETF rolling out? Were you surprised or not surprised by by the, the price action that did on did not happen after that? I mean, we had the high, we had the all time high before the halving, which never happened before. But uh, people were expecting uh, much more than that. Uh, but people also like like it's a, just a Bitcoin ETF. It will have a long term impact, not a short term impact. Like, what's your whole uh, opinion and take on on the Bitcoin ETF this year? Yeah, I think the ETF was inevitable. Um, the whole ETF conversation was happening back in 2017. Um, that was when I first like got involved. That was when I first came to Bitcoin. Um, that was where my journey started. ETFs were inevitable. The financial producing financialization like products that are going to claim to custody Bitcoin were always going to be inevitable. When it comes to the, uh, so well, how would we put it? The, I get like maybe morality um, would be a word for um, what the ETFs are doing to individuals gaining exposure to Bitcoin price appreciation. Uh, it's it's going to sound really boring. It's not particularly polarizing, um, but I don't necessarily see a negative in it. I don't like, I see a negative in the, in the sense of like, yeah, like people aren't actually custodying their own Bitcoin. Yes, that's definitely a negative. Like, it's not yours, all this other stuff. I, I, I hear you on that. Um, but it's also allowing people to get their feet wet with Bitcoin that never would have gotten their feet wet before. Like, because if people can't get exposure to it in their, their IRA or through their fund manager, they don't care. They don't want to touch it. Like, why would they? Right? It's not something that has been around for centuries and centuries across multiple different civilizations across the planet like something like gold i guess people have been exposed to gold since they were kids for generations like there's when it comes to when it comes to um like the the whole bitcoin conversation around being frustrated with people not understanding or taking the time to understand 
like guys like when we're talking about bitcoin like we all know like how much like the fiat hamster wheel sucks but we also have to be aware of how much of the population is stuck on that thing right if you're stuck on the fiat hamster wheel you don't have a whole lot of time to do a whole lot of research right like you're a lot of people are living paycheck to paycheck here in america they don't like and trying to raise kids at the same time or trying to go to college or doing both or all three like there's no time there and then like to have something like bitcoin that it takes a while to grasp like most of almost all of us took at least three touch points to like finally get it right like it took three touch points for me to get bitcoin but then it took me like another two years before i actually like before the whole bitcoin mining and energy relationship clicked so that's like that's like four years of time and i i'm an individual that had specific, like it, like a significant amount of time in that period like I, I had my time in the army i had the time on deployment well um, which those of you that have been in the army you're gonna know there's a lot of a lot of hurry up and wait right so like there's a lot of time to just like sit and listen to podcasts like uh marty bet um most people don't have that kind of time um so when it comes to the frustrations around the etf i understand it but like everybody like needs to like just chill and give people the grace and kind of like understanding that uh 99 of the population is just starting to get their feet wet like they're just starting to get their toes wet like they're not even like their whole foot isn't even in yet so I think that the ETF conversation is mostly positive, um, but there is going to be an event or a number of events where those ETFs are going to go down the route of uh, FTX and, and Sam Bankman Freed, right? There, there's going to be ETFs that are claiming that they have the Bitcoin that they do not. People are going to get burned. People are going to lose the assets that they thought they had, Um there's also going to be events in the sense of hacks and everything like else. Um, I think that there's probably something in Coinbase's future because there hasn't been something significant yet. That usually means that there, uh, that an organization like that is missing something, right? Because pain is pain and loss are the greatest teachers in all of reality. When somebody hasn't experienced it yet, there's going to be something that they're not paying attention to. Um, so that should cause concern for anybody that has bitcoin custodied with coinbase in the sense of hey start looking in the cold cards start looking into wallets start looking into like responsible management of your keys um get that get whatever portion you can afford to live with out of there to protect yourself because um like your conversation with peter dunlap the the future for bitcoin is very bright and very hot as far as like the pricing in fiat terms. Um, Cause like the other thing to consider, like I mentioned earlier, 99% of the global population is not on board yet. Like the boat is still empty. Like <laughs> there's, there's a lot of room to grow. If you are listening to this podcast, you might be wondering what is actually the setup look like of Robin or how can I improve my Bitcoin setup? And there's two things. You have to buy Bitcoin from the right source and you have to store Bitcoin the right way. Let's focus on the first thing how to buy bitcoin it's simple have a bitcoin only exchange don't deal with the shitcoin exchanges don't deal with an exchange that has an own token or something like that be on a bitcoin only exchange i use 21 bitcoin 21 bitcoin is for me the best partner for that and now where do you store bitcoin bitcoin should be stored on a hardware wallet on a self-custody solution where you yourself hold your keys and it should be a cold wallet so that's my simple solutions. That's a bit box. You just put your Bitcoin on there, back up your seed phrase, and you are better than 95% of all Bitcoin hodlers. If you have more than a thousand euros in Bitcoin, it's an absolutely must have. One last thing before we get back to the video. I'm really passionate about meeting other Bitcoiners. And there's an amazing opportunity in middle of Europe in June, the Bitcoin Prague conference. It's the best and biggest Bitcoin only conference in whole of Europe. For all Americans, please visit Europe and visit this place in June. For all Europe's, it's a must go anyways. You are so close to the Bitcoin Prague conference, you basically have to come. I will do interviews there and I would love to meet you all there. Use code ROBIN for all my sponsors to get discounts and use the links down in the description. Yeah, definitely. And I feel like... Um, 
people don't get that we need education. Uh, I myself needed, when the first time I heard Bitcoin, I needed three years to get around from it's a scam to it might be something. I needed three yeah. years. And in those three years, I was in school uh, and I had a lot of time to research. I was an active stock investor researching about new stocks every week. So I had like at least 10, 20 hours every week just to research. And I made good money in, in the stock market, uh, but I always dismissed uh, Bitcoin. So you first need the attention of people and the attention you get with Bitcoin ETFs, you get it with with uh, big things. Also with Michael Saylor that comes in as the first publicly traded company to buy Bitcoin. There's a lot of uh, mainstream action that we need to get the attention. And then we can educate people. But as you say, I love it. Uh, as you said, that uh, people don't even have their toes wet. Like they are <laughs> starting to come in slowly, slowly. Like we are in the very, very early stage and people often get a little bit too, I feel like impatient. Like uh, if, yeah. if you, People ask me like, oh, wow, we know that 1 million or uh, 10 million already, like lower to your time preference, uh, be patient and it's like educate people one by one. Like this, this, this thing takes time. We are, this is a revolution, a monetary revolution that will uh, take place over a very long time and has a huge impact on, on society. So yeah, I, I like uh, how you think about it. Uh, on that topic, uh, and you also have like an, an, an military background and you have the podcast also with the, the Bitcoin veterans. Mm. What do you think an impact on our individual freedom when we have like the first time an asset that has property rights, an asset that nobody can actually take from you, even if they shoot you, uh, which is amazing to think because usually like with force, you can take everything. Like if they have a bar of gold, they can come to you and just take it from you. If they don't want to, they, you can shoot them and then you have the bar of gold. Bitcoin, you actually can take in your heads to your grave, which is an amazing concept. Uh, what do you think with, with your experience in, in, in the military, with your background, um, what will Bitcoin do for our individual freedom? <laughs> Dude, I, I think you could tell by the way I was reacting. I love this question. Um, so I think that it, uh, what Bitcoin is doing and what it's going to do for individual freedom is probably the the biggest thing or the biggest benefit to supporting individual freedom that has happened since 1776 or since the printing press. Um, the 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 big because the big thing with the printing press was the the freedom of distribution of idea, right? Like the um. I don't think the American Revolution or the French Revolution would have been able to happen without the distribution of ideas that came from the printing press. Um, being able to share philosophical ideas around like the, the contemplations of freedom, the value of freedom, and um, what it can enable for a society would not have happened without it. And I think that the way that, say, for, like, like you mentioned, the the... the I would what I like to call the spiteful ownership of Bitcoin is something that has never existed in human history ever. Like the fact that just like that example that you gave, the mere fact that you can own something and you can literally take it to your grave. And if you custody it to the point of where like it's reliant upon memory and you're not exposed to uh, sodium, what is it, bicarbonate or whatever, like the truth serum that actually does exist. If you're not exposed to something like that, you don't diffuse your uh, your your keys over to somebody against uh, quote unquote against your will. You take that to your grave. Nobody's getting that. Like that is not something that has ever existed ever. Like the only thing that has ever existed like that was ideas. Like the great things that Nikola Tesla thought of that he took to his grave that he never wrote down. Right. Um, and Nikola Tesla is also a great example with those actually, because he had so much, so many ideas that were written down on paper that were, uh, confiscated once he died, uh, when he was staying in that hotel room. So the fact that that has never existed before, the fact that you can, you can keep assets and purchasing power from a tyrannical government or a, a individual or organization that would do evil onto you and to others and they can't get anything out of it, like, that's that's a game theoretical relationship that is massive. Because then at that point, 
if if that if if plunder is not a um is not an equitable or valuable strategy what's left if the only thing that's left is cooperation right you got either you can either you can try to coerce or you can cooperate and i think that we would all agree especially right now with what's going on across the world cooperation is in everybody else's um best interests rather than just plundering each other for no good reason other than to support the fiat system and like if you guys have listened if any of uh, your listeners or if you yourself have listened to any of like the bitcoin veterans podcast we talk about that pretty ad nauseum like the the fact that uh looking through american history basically since world war ii we learned that um war is great for business right with all of the bandages the bombs and the bullets uh, small groups of the population are capable of making outsized gains. Um, and all that they have to do is take life elsewhere. And that's a problem. Like that's a, that's, that's not great for the, for the species in general. Um, and then there's also the fact that like, as many of us know, blood begets blood, right? Like there, there's no, there's no winning in war. Everybody loses. Um, so like when you have like all this, like, like these relationships together, just like with the energy sector, when you have all these relationships together with the cooperation, the, the custody, you, you start to see a brighter future ahead. And I think that that's what a lot of, that's, that's what a lot of like us Bitcoiners really, really appreciate is that the more that you dig in, the more that you see that there's an incentive system here to produce more power, which, um, incentivizes human flourishing. Um, there is more incentive to cooperate and work together, which incentivizes human flourishing. And the entire system, uh, the whole, the way that the Bitcoin economics work is that good ideas are going to get funded, which incentivizes human flourishing versus what's going on with the Keynesian um, economic system of the fiat dollar to where as long as you're buddied up um, politically or whatever to the money printer, you're going to get access to it, regardless of whether the idea is good or not. Like all this DEI, what I would argue, um, socialist uh, strategies. Like there's like the the good the the good ideas and the bad ideas have like uh, quote unquote equal access to the money printer. But then you incorporate the political affiliation, and it starts to slide more to the bad ideas get more access to money, and that's a problem. A huge problem. I feel like uh, it's like. I mean, uh, let's not get started on that. But I feel like when you when you have soft money, if you have like uh, a money bring to some central uh, organization, some central authority that all of a sudden can play God with the world, uh, it always goes the wrong direction. Even if it goes good for hundred years, because some miraculous Superman was on the power, even if yeah, it yeah. actually goes good, there's just a matter of time till it goes dramatically wrong <laughs> and and absolute power absu uh, corrupts absolutely so yeah it's 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 fascinating to see that the 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 system already lives for for that long and it, it did not come down till now like it, it comes down but it did not come down completely uh, which uh, is, is is also fascinating for me you mentioned the the podcast the bitcoin veterans podcast um I guess the the main goal of that is also like spreading the message uh, about Bitcoin and and in that sphere. Uh, did you learn from from the experience that having that podcast uh, something special? Like, is is there something uh, that you took away from having those podcast episodes? And like, if you already also interview people, uh, what's your takeaway from from your own podcast? I've I've learned that. Um... To, to my appreciation that there are far more um, brothers and sisters in arms in the, the U.S. military. They're much more, like, ready to, like, have conversations around, like, say, for example, just what is money, right? Um, when, I was, when I was going through the whole kind of, like, dating exposure to the whole Bitcoin conversation and doing my research and reading and everything, um, my entire unit was not open to it at all like there was maybe a handful of us that were looking into it at the same time but everybody was like no like the dollar is the dollar the dollar is king the dollar is america like all this kind of stuff right and i think the last four years in particular in the united states have well and western europe and the entire world 
have exposed a lot of people to the fact of like, oh, okay, maybe what's going on with the dollar is not necessarily um, American or patriotic, right? Because one of the things that I noticed in that in my time in the military was that if you questioned the morality of what the American military or what the U.S. dollar was being used for, it like there was like there was a canyon that was jumped. It was just like, oh, so you're against America? Like you're against freedom? It's like no, like that that's ridiculous. Like to say that uh, to say something like um, using the U.S. military or using the intelligence apparatus to incentivize you know say for example a coup d'etat of another country to supplant a leadership so that they were more susceptible to working with america rather than having a diplomatic and capitalist and mercantile relationship of like hey like we get that you do things differently but let's work together on like one initiative um that to me is more american than the um than the opposite Right. And like, so that has been that particular angle has been really enlightening for me in a lot, in a lot of good ways. And another thing too, is that one of the reasons why we started the podcast was that we also, um, the group of us, the five of us, we also noticed that there is a large lacking of quality kind of like discussions around leadership and masculinity in the entire developed world. Um, there, I know from my personal experience that there are a lot of individuals, particularly men, that have not grown up with access to great um, role models, um, or that the individuals that they thought were great role models were in fact not, right? Like they're championing um, ridiculous uh, philosophies like womanizing and stuff like that. Like, no, like there isn't a whole lot of winning in a society where like we have a bunch of men that think that they need to like just sleep around and, and not actually try and like produce a family and uh have that nuclear relationship where you're developing good members of uh that are going to be part of your society um so that's another aspect and then obviously i bring the whole kind of health conversation to the table which we i don't think we've had that conversation yet which um i very much intend to with regards to making sure we have more americans and it's now getting into uh to europe with uh the europeans and everything of like hey like we need to start taking, if you're not taking your health seriously, it's time to start now. Like, it's never too late to start taking your health seriously. Um, so we're, we're attempting to accomplish, like, multiple objectives all at once with the Bitcoin Veterans Podcast, on top of the entire Bitcoin conversation. I love it. Uh, one one question, I think, like, when whenever the, the topic of masculinity comes up, I feel like masculinity is such a word that gets thrown around so much uh, in the internet that, and often it gets attached to the wrong things. Um, what does it mean yeah. uh, to be masculine? Like, what's masculinity for you? Like, do you have like a definition for that, or like a, a kind of like a guide for that? What what this means? Yeah, I have a I have a general structure, <clears throat> um, and it is primarily it's going to be rooted mostly in stoicism which is a, a, like a, a wing of philosophy for those that haven't had ex exposure to it. Um, Stoicism is largely, think of guys like Marcus Aurelius, um, the Senecas, which would be Seneca the younger and Seneca the older. Um, Arthur Schopenhauer had some good stuff, uh, in my opinion. Frederick Bastiat, which he's not necessarily a Stoicist, but um, guys like that. So my general structure is that like when it comes to masculinity is that Someone who embodies masculinity, whether it's a man or a woman, because technically women can also be masculine too. Um, somebody that is constantly developing themselves to have access and acquire more power, but to the extent of where they're using that power for either protection of themselves or like family or loved ones or their community. Or they're using that power to further benefit themselves or their loved ones or their community. Now, the the um, I'll, you're, I'm sure you did, and then I'm sure your your listeners are going to be like, well, you could use power negatively to like just like benefit just the self and not anybody else, right? It's like, yeah, that's that's very true. Um, when it comes to masculinity, it's a double edged sword, just like anything else. Um, so. And the other, the other thing when it comes to, to masculinity, in my opinion, too, is that um, 
using that power and that acquisition of power. And and when I think of power and acquiring power, I think of self development, like in knowledge and experience and uh, skills and capability. Um, the thing, the big thing about that power is to also make sure it's not weaponized or let loose in irrational or emotional ways, right? Like we like we don't want um, a bunch of guys to have access and skills to the point of where you know they're capable of inflicting violence or some form or fashion to the point of where they get challenged they have an emotional outburst and then they cause significant harm and damage to others when all they needed to do was cool off that's not that's not masculine masculine is uh, the 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 um what's the like the proverb or the the philosophy of like you want to it's better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war Right. Like that's that's the basic gist of it. Have the capability to express ex- like significant or extreme measures of power, but keep that power sheet right until it's necessary. Like that's the thing. And that's uh, that's a beautiful uh, description of it. Uh, I think I heard it. I, f- I feel like I f- think Jordan Peterson was uh, who talked about oh, that yeah. uh, a lot. And he talked about uh being the strong man that you could punch someone in the face and uh, he instantly falls to the ground but not being the one that actually does it because you will have self-discipline uh, over yourself to not do it and actually then cool off but still being to th- have this ability and control that ability that's true self-discipline because he talked about self-discipline yeah. and masculinity in, in that context because if you don't have power <laughs> like self-discipline is really easy for you But if you have power, if you have the power to actually punch someone in the face uh, and and it would end up good for you because the other one is not two times bigger than you uh, and still not do it, that's like true self-discipline. And uh, this is a little bit also like uh, what, what you talked about. I love it uh, how you define it, um, even though it has not a lot to do with Bitcoin, uh, but I feel like it's actually important. I would, I would argue that it, it, it does. Um Because when it comes to, like, just think of, like, the amount of wealth and purchasing power that a lot of our Bitcoin compatriots are going to be acquiring over the next years or decades. There's going to be a lot of individuals that are going to have the capability to do things that do not benefit others or that negatively impact others, right? And that's going to be where, where the discipline portion comes in, right? Like, um not necessarily funding certain things or um or just using that those funds or those 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 capabilities to benefit others where maybe you're not necessarily getting a whole lot of out of like out of it immediately right like like being able to like if you're an individual with a lot of purchasing power and you notice that like say something some sort of economic difficulty falls onto your country like maybe say an economic depression And you have funds and capabilities to produce something that provides more power than you need and you can provide power to others, you can do that. But you'll also have the capability to do that and not provide it to others to the point of where you become like effectively a JP Morgan, where it's like, okay, I built the power, now pay me, or you're not getting access to it. Like stuff like that. Like so like it, it still very much does touch the whole Bitcoin conversation. It it's, uh, also goes in the direction where like when we actually are in this future where Bitcoin is so valuable because it became the base layer of our financial system, it's the global reserve asset uh, and stuff like that, then individuals that now actually had the self-discipline to hold on to their power for so long and actually still have it in like 10 years, 15 years, uh, they have a big responsibility. And I feel like Bitcoiners in general, like, I rarely met a Bitcoiner who has bad intentions uh, and uh, most of the Bitcoiners are really true givers and true um, just kind people in general. Uh, yeah. So I feel like that could uh, also impact the, the world in a positive way uh, to, because Bitcoin rewards the people that are uh, early on very curious uh, and, and want to like better the world to, to a certain extent, which will, which is interesting to think about. Uh, but yeah, um, for the end of the pod, before we start to the end of the podcast, 
I want to know what are you currently extremely passionate about that we not touched on till now? Like what's what's outside of, of Bitcoin and outside of the topics that we we touched on today? Uh, is there any uh, passion that you have? Is there anything that you are currently learning deeply or recently? Yeah. So um, again, I love this question. You have great questions. Um, I have three things. So one is uh, something that uh, anybody who follows me already is already going to know. Um, I'm really passionate about the health and fitness area. Like I said, I went to college for exercise science, um, certified personal trainer. Like I'm all about like everybody, man or woman, lift heavy, like get up to get into the gym, start moving around some iron. Like it's good for you. The more that we have a strong, healthy population, we have a strong, healthy community. We have a strong, healthy economy. We have a strong, healthy country. And pri primarily here in America, we don't have that. We don't really have any of that, honestly. Like it's like the, the entire system is so fragile because the average individual is so fragile that um, we have a series, a serious, uh, a serious series of vulnerabilities that need to be addressed. And I think like the ground level is getting all the moms and dads and the future moms and dads into working out to be healthy, to take their nutrition seriously and to treat their bodies like a true temple to where they're built. Like I want those bodies built out of granite, not out of sticks and twigs. Like the stronger the temple, the better for everybody else. Um, another passion of mine is something I've talked about a little bit. I haven't really talked about a whole lot is that, and I'm working on writing a book about is that I personally believe we are going through the early innings of the second like global renaissance. Um, the first one kind of touched on before with like the printing press and the exchange of ideas. Um, I think that what we're witnessing right now um, with Bitcoin and with the like what we talked about earlier with the relationship of Bitcoin mining and energy and the incentivization incentivization of broad spectrum aggressive energy infrastructure expansion and growth is going to result in the next renaissance that is going to bring out all sorts of new ideas um and it's going to be coupled with um artificial intelligence i can guarantee that um there's a lot of there's a lot of uh emotionally and politically charged conversation around artificial intelligence a lot of it is based in merit in my opinion um there's a lot of evil that is capable of Uh, of being expressed because of artificial intelligence, but there's also, in my what I would argue, a lot more good that is capable of coming out of it. Because um, like the the whole like Skynet conversation, like we're so far away from that. Like I think people need to just kind of like calm themselves a little bit. So there's the whole second Renaissance that I'm super excited about. Um, hopefully, I can get that book wrapped up here this year and get it like to some sort of uh, being printed at some point. It's going to happen. I would rather it be sooner than later, but uh, hopefully that that's coming in the future. And then um, the last thing that I will say that is a passion that's probably not really related to anything is that I've been digging into um, some of the uh, stuff that had to do with the John F. Kennedy presidency and looking into like Alan Dulles and the director of Central Intelligence. So that that's a that's a fun little rabbit hole, but hopefully that doesn't get you shut off uh, YouTube too much just because I mentioned it. <laughs> Usually not. Like uh, YouTube has been nice to me since since the beginning, and I had some pretty uh, interesting conversations already. Okay. Uh, so, but uh, let's see. I'm just keeping it going uh, till till it uh, breaks, and if it breaks, I will learn from that and and <laughs> sweeten it out for YouTube a little bit in the future. <laughs> Uh, but it's really interesting. Uh, definitely let me know when the book is out and uh, let's have you on again and, and let's see what the book is all about and uh, discuss it on the podcast. Uh, which I also want to do a note like AI, one and a half years ago or maybe one year ago, one and a half years ago, I never used AI on like and never used AI uh, intentionally. And now I use it every day for my podcast. Just for my podcast, I use it every day multiple times. I mean, I also have a daily podcast, so I produce every day one, uh, but there are so many intersections now. And uh, I feel like, I don't know if I'm already at this point, but I feel like I'm at like 50-50 where I use Google versus AI. So like AI is coming more and more up, especially for 
uh, preparation uh, and getting a little bit of overview. I even have like a small GPT programmed where I can just type in a name uh, and they are summarizing me uh, the whole guests that will come on the show, uh, give me suggestions for the questions and give me uh, links where I can learn more about it. So this is an amazing Dang. tool, an amazing tool where I'm like learning about new guests in like two minutes. Uh, obviously, I'm then going into the uh, interviews and trying to learn more about it. I'm using then a YouTube transcript tool to get more information to the ChatGPT tool that from that uh, interview, that one hour interview, get get me the summary of that, get me some questions out of that. So like, and this is just like a small example I, I, because I do everyday podcasts and I'm just one person, like there's no team <laughs> behind me. Uh, I have to be really efficient and AI is fascinating in um, being more efficient with your time. So I, I love AI and the tools and I feel like uh, AI will not take your job, but someone with AI will take your job. Uh, that's <laughs> my, my fa favorite line always. Uh, that's uh, that, that's how I how I look at it. Yeah, you know, I, like, and that's, that's the other thing too, is like with the kind of like the, the, the doominess around artificial intelligence, um, some of it is merited. Like, don't get me wrong. Like I said before, like some of it is merited. There are going to be jobs that are going to be lost because of it. Um, but we have to look at technological revolutions of the past. And I get, again, our artificial intelligence is not like the, the um, other technological revolutions, but I'm willing to bet that a very similar relationship is going to result to where artificial intelligence is going to allow for efficient like efficiency gains as far as jobs to get done like you're describing now to the point of where others are capable of producing companies that are going to produce jobs for people that are going to like they're going to be needed anyway it's like because like if you look at if you look at like the internet or the automobile a lot of people were concerned about like the stable boys losing jobs um they got more jobs like, because you have to maintain the technology when it comes to it, right? So, like, there's going to be more need for developers, like, cleaning up code and all this other stuff. There's going to be more need for individuals maintaining data centers that are powering the artificial intelligence to begin with. Um, so, yeah, like, I like I think that, I think the like, a lot of this stuff is going to be culminating together to more bright futures than most people are, like, are willing to, to really accept or, like, conceive of right now. And on an individual level, nobody has to be fearful of it. If you are willing to be open, if you're willing to learn, if you're willing to adopt. So if you're like uh, um, not lazy and just like keep on and and, and skill up, uh, then 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 you you don't have to fear it. If you're just like if you're in a job where you like you can explain this job uh, and someone else could do it in a similar quality after like maybe five hours or four hours. Uh, then then you probably be, will be replaced at some point from a robot uh, or maybe like uh, an AI or something like that. I don't know how it goes with physical stuff. Like also the physical robots are getting better and better. I don't know if like building houses or something like that is something that humans will do in 50 years. Uh, it's also uh, a train to the body. But yeah, we will see. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about uh, where AI and robotics uh, moving. Uh, we have to be careful, but as you said, like this, this kind of future, we are, we are far away from that, but we definitely have to be, uh, aware of, of the AI's power too. Um, yeah. for, for the end routine of the podcast, uh, like we have an end routine in the podcast where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest, uh, actually <laughs> is, uh, That's okay. it's like a blockchain through the, through the, uh, through the different, uh, like the, the guests are connected, like the blocks in the blockchain. Uh, yep. I love that concept. I stole it from the diary with your CEO. Uh, the, the one has nothing to do with Bitcoin, but I was like for a Bitcoin podcast, it's perfect. Um, okay. and the, the, the question for you is what has to happen in order for you to move to a different uh, country? Ooh, um, I don't know. I don't know if, uh, probably not gonna like the answer, but like I, with my, my roots being in the army, my whole, like my whole family on both sides being, uh, being soldiers or sailors or airmen. Um, if I end up in another country, it's going to be because something happened in the U S the U S split into other countries. Like I'm like, I'm like, if, if things are going to be 
getting to any sort of like bifurcation. Um, I'm going to be defending the side that is promoting like individual freedom. Like, so I, I'm, I'm going to put it that way. Um, I have no intention of running from a fight. I have no intention of fleeing to El Salvador. I have thought about it for years. Um, I don't want to be known as the one that, that ran away because things got difficult. I would rather stick around and fight things out with, uh, with my Bitcoin veteran, my brother and sisters. I would rather like lock arms and be shoulder to shoulder with some guys that I respect and defend the, the freedoms that allow for, um, our women and children to be capable of like actually chasing their dreams into the future. I'd rather, I'd rather be doing that. Um, so whoever the, the last guest was like, I'm sorry, but I'm not, I'm not moving. I'm not fleeing this country. I love that mindset a lot. Um, to close it up, thank you, Mike, uh, for being on the podcast. It was a pleasure talking with you. It was an amazing hour that we had uh, today and a uh, great discussion. I think uh, a lot of people can take a lot of uh, insights and valuable things from that discussion. Uh, thank you for being on and uh, thank you for taking the time. Hey, man, I thank you for uh, for just reaching out to me on Twitter through a DM. Like, that's, that's, that's an easy way to just, like, try and reach out to me and ask questions. So, like, Again, like I'm honored that you wanted to hear my my opinions on things. So I had a lot of fun, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. What, what's the best way to reach out to you, Twitter? Uh, like, if if people have questions for you, uh, Twitter is the best yep. way. Yep. So Twitter is going to be the best way. Um, my handle is at the so T H E E Mike and then Hobart H O B A R T. Um, I started spelling it out because I, for the first couple of years, I was getting notified that I was so heavily shadow banned that unless people knew exactly how to spell my username, like they couldn't find me. So like, like therefore you, like your users and you, like you guys have the username to try and track me down. Um, if you have any questions, just shoot me a DM. Um, less people reach out to me than you'd expect. So if you if you have a question or you want to have a conversation, just hit me up. Most of my inbox is filled with bots, so I appreciate I appreciate it when a real person is actually trying to interact with me. I feel like I have to save inbox. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and for everybody listening in on not Twitter, uh, uh, Mike is like linked down in the description. Like just link, uh, can look there, and like I will uh, I will link it. And on X. It's tagged in, in, in the in the touch store. Like that's that's really easy. Uh, anyways, uh, so thank you for being on. Yeah, thank you for having me, man. <laughs>